Welcome. My name is Jesse and you are listening to The Wake Up Call. This show is about opening your eyes to how you've been living, bringing awareness to the standard you've been operating at, and helping you start living to your full potential. There are two ways I'll help you do this. One, by disciplining your mind, and two, by strengthening your body. It's time to take stock of your current performance and go to the next level. Let's do this. What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Wake Up Call. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about what a quality strength training program looks like from start to finish. So I've been involved in gyms. If you've been following from episode one, you know I've been involved in gyms, rec centers, a CrossFit box, and now running my own strength training business for over 12 years. Okay, And in that time, I've seen a lot of different fads, gimmicks, and different things come into play within the fitness space. So in the early 2000s, it was BOSUs, and then there was, you know, a lot of different types of approach using cables, and then I've seen, you know, bodybuilding type approaches. I've seen people kind of get into like powerlifting and everything in between. But one of the common things that I see happen with people who just sign up to a commercial type of gym is that everyone seems to do the same routine. From start to finish, everybody seems to do the same type of, you know, routine and structure. But the problem is, what most people are doing is actually wrong, and it's ineffective. And I'm going to call that the old model. So this is things that, you know, people perhaps read in a men's health magazine, or a bodybuilding uh, magazine, or they see something on YouTube, and then they try it out, and they think that's the way to go, when in reality, there is a much more effective way to go about your training. And I'm gonna share that with you today. But I wanna run through first what the average gym goer does. And this is something that you've probably seen or maybe you're even doing it yourself. So I wanted to make you aware of what that sort of ineffective and old style of gym training approach is so that you can be mindful of it and then afterwards you will know what to look out for and you can actually do a better and a more effective style of training. So this is how most people who don't know what they're doing train. This is what they do. So you rock up, you enter the gym, and then you start with cardio, five, 10, 15 minutes worth of cardio, you know, just to get your heart rate up, get your body moving. And then once you've done it, you get off your treadmill, the elliptical, the bike, whatever it happens to be, and you do some stretching. You do some static stretching. Maybe you lay down on the floor and you try and do the toe touch, you know, the hamstring stretch and you know you stand up and you do your quad stretch and you bring your arm across the body and you do your shoulder stretch and maybe you do the doorway stretch and you get your pecs a little bit so you've done your cardio and then you go and do some static stretching and then you head out into the weight section but you don't go and jump on the free weights you don't really feel too comfortable doing that so you end up going and doing machines they feel safe they're easy to do So you go and do a bunch of machine weights, a few different exercises and machines, pulleys, things like that. And then at the end of that, you go and finish with a bit of abs and a bit of core. You know, you want to feel the burn in the midsection. You want to feel like that midsection is getting sculpted and getting toned. And then once you've done that, you hop off and you think, I better do a bit of cardio as well. You know, keep my my heart in good health and work on a bit of lung function as well. So you've done your abs and core and you jump on the cardio where you started to finish off with a bit of steady state cardio. So it's, you know, 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on how much time you've got. And you just sort of go through the motions on a piece of cardio machinery. And then once you've done that, you finish with a bit of stretching and then you go home. That's what most people do. They rock up and they run through that sequence. And I know this because I've seen it happen over the last 10 to 12 years. That is just what most people do. It seems to be indoctrinated that that is the way to train. But I can tell you, it is ineffective. And there is a better way to do it. But these are the issues I see with the approach I just mentioned. Like I said, this is what I would call the old model of training. What has been indoctrinated and sort of set down from one person to another, or it's just a matter of monkey see monkey do you see harold or gerald doing it and you think oh he looks like he's in okay shape or he's been going for a while i'll just kind of follow what he does but the problem with following the masses is that the masses are often wrong and in this case 
it is an ineffective way. And these are the issues I see with it. When you rock up, whether it's before you go to work, whether it's in your lunch break, or whether it's after work, you've been sitting down for a number of hours, or even just in the drive to get to the gym. So you get yourself there, and then you go and do some cardio, five to 15 minutes of mind-numbing cardio. And if you're doing a seated exercise, like the seated bike, you know, how, how much time do you think you spend sitting each day? And then you go to the gym somewhere to actually work out and train and work on your physical activity, and you go and sit down some more. It doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I understand if, you know, perhaps you have knee issues, the bike is a good option, sure. But if you don't have an injury, the seated bike probably isn't the most effective method of training for you. Or if you're not on the bike, perhaps you go on the treadmill. And I see some people, they do an incline walk, so the, the treadmill's going really, really fast, but they're holding onto the, uh, the frame or the handle in front of them, which basically negates the whole impact and the effect of having an incline in the first place. Or if you're not doing your speed walking on an incline, which is now longer an incline, you do some running, you do some jogging. So let's say it's six o'clock in the morning. You roll out of bed, you get changed, you get in your car, you go to the treadmill and you start running. The body is not ready and is not prepared for that high impact work. Or if you know, you've know you got a few kilos that perhaps you shouldn't, maybe you've got a spare tire around the midsection, you go and do some running. It's excessive joint impact on your hips, knees, ankles, and lower back with zero preparation. It's a terrible way to start your training session. But anyway, you've done your cardio. Then you think it's a good idea. Okay, before I go and lift the weights and put my body under load, I'm gonna do some stretching because you know I wanna preserve my body. I wanna do the right thing and make sure that I'm not gonna pull a muscle or strain anything. So in theory, that sounds great. The problem is it's not the most effective. And this is why. When you do static stretching, you are holding a set position for X amount of time. So you've just done something to bring your heart rate up, and then you're going to hold a stretch for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever it is. You are now cooling the body down. Static stretching also reduces power production. So when you do strength training, your muscles are either contracting or they are going through a phase of what is called eccentric and concentric contractions. The muscles are lengthening, shortening, lengthening, shortening. Unless you're doing an isometric exercise, which is where the muscles are contracting but the muscle length does not change, your muscles and your joints are actually being moved. Shortened, lengthened, shortened, lengthened. So you just holding a stretch is going to reduce the amount of power that you can produce. Static stretching also does nothing to excite your nervous system. So if you think about some time where you've gone to try and pick something up, the, up off the ground and you think it's really light and then it's actually really significantly heavy, it kind of shocks your body. Your body is not prepared for the weight that you're actually trying to lift. And the same is also true if you try and pick up something which you think and you perceive to be really, really heavy and it's actually really, really light. You over exert and you contract more muscle groups than necessary and the thing flies off the ground. That is your nervous system actually prepared to lift and move a load or a resistance. Static stretching does nothing to excite your nervous system. And it doesn't improve joint mobility. So sure, holding a stretch, you know, you're feeling this sensation of stretching, okay? It feels like you're doing something for the muscle, but you're doing nothing really for the joint itself. So when you go and do strength training, when you're lifting weights, you are moving. Okay, so you're not actually helping the joints themselves. If we think of some of the big joints of the body where people have generally some of the biggest issues, shoulders, very, very stiff, very tight, very immobile. Static stretching isn't improving your joint mobility. Sure, you feel like a stretch, but your joint is designed to work in multiple planes. You should be able to lift the arm overhead into flexion. You should be able to bring the arm behind your body into extension. You should be able to lift the arm up, which is abduction. You should also be able to rotate your shoulder. Holding one single position or stretch isn't going to improve your joint mobility. So there's the static stretching component. 
Then you go and you lift some weights, but you do it on machines. If you want to be good at pushing a lever or moving a pulley in a set and a predetermined path, that's awesome. You go for it, you stay to the machines. But if you want to be strong for life and learn how to actually move your body and manipulate your body and stay injury free, you must learn how to use free weights. Put your body through a range of positions different loading strategies, whether it's a barbell, a dumbbell, a kettlebell, a sandbag, or even your own body weight. Machines put you in a predetermined position and predetermined path of movement. Free weights do not. You therefore have a better awareness of how to move your body through space. So you can see which is the most, or which is the more effective style of training there, okay? Then after you've done your machine weights, you go and do some abs or core because you know you wanna feel like you've done something for your midsection. Maybe there's a little bit of extra flab there you wanna get rid of so you think, if I do enough crunches or if I do enough sit-ups, that's gonna come off. Eh, wrong. That's not how it works. I've said it before and I'll say it again, you cannot out-train a bad diet. So if the midsection is an area you want to improve and tone up and you know trim off a little bit, it's gonna come more from your diet than it does from any individual exercise. But working specifically on you know, crunches and sit-ups, it's an isolation type exercise and it doesn't really carry over to anything else. Sure, you feel a burn, those muscles are contracting really, really hard, but it's actually, those exercises are actually quite bad for your back and also for the neck for the amount of strain they do. It's repetitive flexion. You're continually bending through the neck, the cervical spine, but also through the lumbar spine. You're just repeatedly cranking on those lower back discs over and over again. So a more effective exercise selection for you would be to do exercises which are what is called anti-movement. These are exercises where you are trying to resist your body being put in a position it does not want to go, which for example would be like a plank. Everyone's done the plank to some degree. Maybe it's a front plank, maybe it's a side plank. But these goals, these are isometrics. These are where the muscles are engaged and working, but they're not moving. Okay, so it's where you have to hold your midsection, your trunk, your torso in a strong, stable position. While gravity wants to perhaps arch your back, so it wants to extend. Maybe the side plank, it wants to pull you into side bending, so the lateral muscles are working. Or maybe it's just carrying something. Maybe it's a farmer's carry. You're having to hold a really strong, upright, rigid torso while you move. Those things are going to carry over significantly more than just doing an isolation type exercise like crunches or sit-ups. So you've done your abs and your core, and then you wanna do something in terms of just general health and fitness, a little bit for heart function, which is incredibly important. I'm not saying it's not, but the type of cardio isn't going to make enough of a dent to significantly improve your fitness. So generally when people have finished their abs or their core, they go and do you know 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how long they're in the gym for, and it's steady state. So what I mean by that is there's no real fluctuation of speed, uh, distance, or intensity. It's just you jump on, you set it to a speed or an incline or a resistance level, and off you go. You just stay at that particular uh, level or that difficulty from start to finish. So the problem with that is it's not long enough to build a strong aerobic base. Okay, 10 to 20 minutes probably isn't going to cut it. And it's also not intense enough to improve your VO2 max, your body's ability to transfer oxygen and utilize it to the highest degree possible. And it's also not going to give you a significant calorie burn because your body is not in what is called an oxygen debt. So if you've ever done intervals before or heard of interval training, it is fantastic because it has an effect, what is called EPOC. EPOC stands for Energy Post-Exercise Oxygen Consumption. Intervals are fantastic in the fact that they work between alternating efforts of work and rest. So when you work, your heart rate goes up, it spikes, and then you have a period of recovery or rest. And you alternate between work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. And if you had a graph of your heart rate, you would just see it go up and down, up and down, up and down. And the reason that that is so effective is because 
when you're working really hard, it is for a specific duration, but it's not sustainable for a long period of time. And the reason we have the recovery is so that you had, can regenerate enough energy, but also recuperate enough oxygen for another bout of work. This is what creates an oxygen debt. When you are in an oxygen debt, your body burns more calories after exercise to recover that lost oxygen and bring you back to neutral. Okay, so that's how you have an additional calorie burn after you exercise. You're burning more calories and at a higher rate until your body has recuperated that lost oxygen. All right, so you've done your steady state cardio. After you've done that, you go and stretch because you think, okay, I need to look after my muscles, and then you go home. So this is a super common stretch that people do, hamstrings. You know, people who have lower back issues or just in general, if they feel like they can't, you know, bend over at the front and touch their toes. A toe touch is a very simple test. People bend over and they can't touch their toes, so they think, oh, my hamstrings are tight. So if your hamstrings are tight, what do you do? You stretch. But then after doing that for weeks at a time, you don't see any changes. So you think, I've got to stretch more. And yet nothing ever changes. Your toe touch never improves. Your flexibility doesn't ever get better. But the cycle never ends. Nothing ever improves. So people are stuck in this cycle and this kind of rut of training, which is ineffective. So now we know what doesn't work. That's the old model. That's what most people do. But most people, unfortunately, are following an ineffective approach. This is the way that I run my training sessions. And this is how I would encourage you to start doing your strength training. Everything in this next series that I'm about to explain and cover with you has a reason and a purpose. So when people come in and work with me, when I'm coaching them, this is the series from start to finish. They come in, we activate muscle groups. So if, you're, if you spend a lot of your day sitting, we have a specific set of muscle groups which are switched off or dormant. We wanna wake them up and excite them because they are perhaps underactive, weak, or they are gonna be vital to the exercises that the training session is about to uh, put them through. So typically, some form of upper back, core, so it might be obliques, might be abs, and also glutes. So we do activate muscles. After we have activated muscles, we mobilize joints. So muscle activation also helps us get into better positions, which is why it is before mobilization. Mobility, I start from the top and work my way down. Neck mobility, shoulder mobility, upper back mobility, hip mobility, ankle mobility. We are mobilizing the big joints in the body. Each joint has a function and has a range of motion it should be able to do and get into. And if it doesn't, if you do something long enough and effective enough, it will improve. But you notice there's no stretching there. Activate muscles, mobilize joints, and then train. So the way we get into the training after we've done a nice warm up and that series is to do some warm up sets. So let's say, for example, your first exercise is deadlifts. You're going to use a barbell and you're going to do some deadlifts. I always start people with the barbell on its own, empty bar, 20 kilos. So even if you can deadlift 120 kilos, 140 kilos, 160 kilos, whatever your max is, you're gonna start with an empty bar. You're going to do what is called grease the groove. You are priming your body and you are imprinting a certain pattern of movement so that when we start adding weight, the movement looks the same, it feels the same. We're getting any kinks out of the exercise and we're trying to essentially get rid of any rust that is within the joints, okay? So we're getting movement and we're putting the body through its paces. The warm-up sets increase blood flow. They further improve joint mobility so you can get in the correct position to lift and reduce your risk of injury, but also prepare the body for the movement and progressively get it ready for the weight it's about to lift. So the warm-up sets look, might look like this. Let's say, for example, you're going to build up to... 100 kilos for your working sets. You would start with the empty barbell and do, I have a, I have a series of uh, five reps that I do, a five, five, five series. 
The bar is in the hands. You push your hips backwards, brush the bar down your thighs until it gets just above your knees. You push your hips through, squeeze your butt, stand up tall. You do that five times. Then you do the same thing, but the bar's gonna travel a little bit lower and it's going to get to just below your kneecap. So you've gone five above the knee, five below the knee, and then the last five are to mid shin. The bar finishes at mid shin in the bottom position. Push the floor away, get the hips through and squeeze the butt, standing nice and tall. Five reps, there's your final five. After that, it might look like 60 kilos. And then it might look like 80 kilos. And then 90 kilos until finally we arrive at working weight of 100 kilos. So this is something that a lot of people skip over or are completely unaware of at all, is the importance of warm-up sets. If your goal is to get strong, you must train to get strong. And that means every single set, every single rep, you are focusing on your technique. As I mentioned in the last podcast, there's only one thing you should be focusing on when strength training, and that is your technique. So even doing your warm-up sets, you're not just going through the paces just to get them done. No, you're actually ingraining good technique because the more efficient your technique is, the easier it will be for you to lift that weight off the ground. So you've done your warm-up sets and then you get into your working sets, okay? So that's exercise one. Exercise one is typically the exercise which allows you to lift the heaviest amount of weight. And the reason that that has to go first is it's priority number one and it is when you are as close to 100% as you will ever be during that training session. So you walk in through the door, you do your warm up, activate, mobilize, train. You do your warm up sets, you build up to your working sets, bang, exercise one, ticked off. Once you've done exercise one, I generally put a superset together, exercise 2A and 2B. Typically, different muscle groups. Now, this is where there's a bit of individualization when it comes to programming, which I could talk about for days. Honestly, I could talk about programming until the cows come home and I'm blue in the face. I love programming. It's where I get to geek out and really do my thing. But I put two exercises together. And if you're not familiar, a superset is where you put two exercises together with no rest. So you do exercise A, exercise B, and then you rest. It is a very time efficient way to train, and it allows you to get a good amount of quality work done. So I'm not putting a whole circuit together of 10 exercises where you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and they're all done with really shitty form. No, you do two exercises together. But when it's time to do exercise A, you focus on doing that to the best of your ability. Once you've done A, you go over to exercise B and you do the same thing. All right, then you have a rest. Okay, so with exercise number one, you have long rest periods. You are lifting a heavy amount of weight for you. So exercise one typically has two minutes of rest. Exercise 2A, 2B, I generally allocate about 90 seconds of rest. And then we do another superset, exercise 3A, 3B. And that has about 60 seconds of rest, give or take. But that's a very, very effective way to get strong. Five exercises. Push, pull, hinge, squat, and then we either have something to improve a weak area or focusing on core or grip. So those are areas which generally transfer to a lot of other exercises, okay? Improving core strength will help a deadlift. Improving your grip strength will help a deadlift, just as an example there. So you can see they're two completely different approaches so far. And then what comes next is really, really important because this is the missing ingredient for a lot of people. And this is why you haven't made the progress that you want. With the exercises and this routine that I'm explaining, you must use the progressive overload principle. So this is the way I explain it to my clients. Week one is kind of easy to moderate. All right, we're not maxing out, we're not hitting any PBs, we're not gonna break any records. Week one is the easiest week. And I typically program and put uh, my routines together in four week blocks. So week one is kind of moderate. You learn the movements, you dial in the form, you get a baseline, and you get accustomed to everything. 
that's really what week one is. It's an introduction to all, perhaps their new movements, perhaps they're a little bit of a variation from the pro, uh, previous cycle, or perhaps this is just your first program. Week one, I'm not gonna smash you into the ground. Week one, I want you to get some baseline data on the board. So if you're doing a set of five deadlifts, what's challenging? Like what is a weight that you can do five good quality reps without breaking your back, without feeling like you're having to strain and max out? That's what week one is. You're just getting some numbers on the board. It's just a starting point. That's all it is. But then the progressive overload part is where week two. The goal of week two is to beat all of your numbers on week one. And when I mean beat week one, I'm talking about every single exercise. You've got five exercises that you have to try and beat in some way, shape, or form. If it's a deadlift, can we put extra weight on the bar? Yes or no? As long as technique permits. So we're either trying to add weight, increase reps, or make some part of the exercise more difficult, or by using better technique. So in week two, we beat week one. In week three, we beat week two score. In week four, we beat week three. So week four, like I said, is generally how I program in four week blocks. Week four is the hard week. Week four is the one you have to get yourself up for and you really have to think about what you're doing before you get to the gym. Okay, it's a challenging, it is a tough week. That is the hard one. But after you've done your strength training, we finish with what is called a WOD, the workout of the day. And this is where there's a bit of variation, a bit of variety. So everybody's always looking for variety to spice things up. This is where there's a bit of flexibility within the program. It is a finisher. It is designed to spike your heart rate, to challenge your position under fatigue. And these are generally simple, low complexity exercises that go from two to six minutes, thereabouts. So most people do their strength training really fast and they wanna try and jack their heart rate up and they just wanna run themselves into the ground. No, no, no. You focus on your technique, you focus on doing it as best as you can and you focus on lifting the heaviest amount of weight that you can. After you've done all of that stuff and focused on building your strength, now we can work on actually the fitness and the metabolic side of things. Get your heart rate up, work fast, but do it well. That is the goal. It's a short amount of time, two to six minutes. Work really, really hard. It's gonna be hard. You're gonna huff and puff. You're gonna breathe hard. That's the whole point. <laughs> That's how you improve. That's how you develop your fitness. That is how you improve your fat loss is because when we do something very, very difficult for a handful of minutes, it creates an oxygen debt. Like I said, that's what's missing with the old model of steady state cardio. This allows you to create a big oxygen debt. So once you've finished your wad, the goal is to bring your heart rate down. So let's say you've done your wad, your heart rate is, you know, your heart's pumping out of your chest, your heart rate is at 170 beats a minute, and you're feeling like you've just absolutely worked yourself right into the ground. You've worked hard, you've done it well, now you can relax. The goal is to bring the heart rate down, do some form of mobility, and then go home. But the first thing we're doing is trying to bring the heart rate down. The goal is to return to neutral, also known as homeostasis, as quickly as possible. This is where people absolutely shoot themselves in the foot and why they feel like shit and they never recover is because when they finish, they walk out of their door and they're still fucking huffing and puffing. This Their heart rate is still elevated at 170 or 160 beats a minute. And I've seen this. I've gone to I've gone to go and train my clients and I've seen people finish a boot camp and they are still sweating and they have literally just finished an exercise. They've grabbed their shit, they've grabbed their keys, their wallet, their towel, and they've run out the door to get in their car. So even when they get home, they're still huffing and puffing and breathing and sweating. That doesn't lead to good recovery. It leads to an elevated amount of stress in the system, in the body as a whole, which is terrible for recovery, but it also keeps stress levels elevated for longer than necessary. So when you finish training, relax, breathe, take a deep breath, 
actually take several. And then once you're relaxed and you're back to a neutral state, like you kind of were at the beginning of the session, maybe you've still got a light sweat happening, maybe the heart rate's a little bit elevated as it should be, then you can get out the door. So one of the best recovery practices that I like to do with my clients, especially after a hard wad, is to do some 90 degree breathing. You simply lie on the floor and you put your feet or your calves up onto a bench or a step or something like that. What it does is it brings blood flow back to central circulation and allows you to focus on your breathing. Relax, the arms are completely shut off. You're not actually having to support your body weight. The bench and the ground is doing that for you. And you're just trying to take some big breaths in and bring yourself back down to neutral. And that right there, my friend, is what a quality strength training program actually looks like from start to finish. Ignore the old model. Don't follow the masses. Don't be a sheep and do what everyone else does. Because most people just go and they punch the clock just like they do at work. They go there and they do the same routine over and over again and they stretch the same muscles and they never make any fucking progress. I want you to be different. I want you to be the outlier who actually has a plan and sticks to it. So, recapping. When you walk into the gym, when you come to train, this is how we do it. Activate muscles, mobilize joints, train. You do a couple warm-up sets to get yourself in the correct positions and prime your nervous system to handle heavier loads. Progressive overload principle. On week two, you beat week one. On week three, you beat week two. On week four, the hard week, you try and beat week three's numbers. And you finish with some form of wad. Something that is gonna push you out of your comfort zone, that's gonna make you work, it's gonna make you huff and puff, it's gonna make you sweat, and these are all fine, these are great. It's for a couple of minutes. It's not gonna kill you. But if you don't do these things and put yourself into voluntary, uh, yeah, voluntary stressful situations, when you are involuntarily put in these situations, you will crumble. You will crumble like a fucking biscuit, unless you do it on your own terms. Couple minutes, hard graft, hard work, focus on what you're doing, do it at some good pace, and then once you've finished, relax. Bring the heart rate down. As soon as you have finished your workout of the day, the goal is recovery. How quickly can you bring your body back to neutral? And there you have it, guys. That is the strength system that I use. Been using it, I've been refining it for years, and it works. I don't follow principles, protocols, or exercises which no longer serve me or don't work. And these are tips, and these are pieces of information which I have picked up along the years from world-class coaches, from world-leading physiotherapists, and people who are at the top of their level in sport. So they do work, and they work if you work. So I hope that gives you an understanding of what a strength training program should look like. Not just an ordinary one, not an average one that you know Joe Bloggs or Harold or Gerald is doing down at your local health club or gym. This is what a quality strength program looks like from start to finish. And if it doesn't have those components, you're missing the boat. So there we have it, guys. I'm gonna leave you there. You've got uh, something to think about with regards to your strength training. Take it seriously. Do it the right way, and the program will reward you because of it. Thanks for listening, guys. I'll chat to you soon for another episode. Until then, keep getting stronger. Strength is never a weakness, and weakness is never a strength. If you loved the wake-up call, found it entertaining, or got some benefit out of listening, I would appreciate you helping me to spread the word. Please share it with a friend or on social media so that you can pay it forward and give someone else the opportunity to improve themselves like you just have. Thanks for listening. We'll see you soon for another episode.